remember the line going silent. And the last thing he said before he hung up was, well, it was fun while it lasted. It was happening. Mike and I were, were splitting up. Mike was the first guy to ever meet my parents, the first guy I ever saw myself marrying, and the first guy I ever said I love you to. So when we broke up over the phone, I was devastated. Fun while it lasted? This was fun, I thought to myself. Fun? Fun? Fun made it seem like we had what Ralph Macchio and Elizabeth Shue had in The Karate Kid, just like, oh, taking pictures at the mall and fighting off the high school bullies when we didn't have fun. We had eight months of epic gone with the wind type shit, okay? I didn't handle the breakup very well. One of my coping mechanisms was making jokes, obviously. My other coping mechanism was more dangerous. Instead of the classic move of being taken out by girlfriends to cope with the heartache and get my groove back, I spent many nights alone, shamefully obsessing over dudes on Facebook. <laughs> when I crush on someone, I crush hard. I crush hard and insanely. Dan Voss was a sad victim of this. He was fucking adorable. He was an LA comedian with a raspy voice and glasses and always sported a plaid shirt over a band tee. In a text to a friend, I referred to him as having a face like Cameron, but a swagger like Ferris. <laughs> All of that sprinkled with a bit of whimsy and vulnerability as displayed by his owning a cat and being a genuine fan of the band Bright Eyes. I gathered some of this information uh, from meeting him a handful of times, but the majority of it came out of stalking his Facebook every day and listening to, if not memorizing, every podcast he was listed under on iTunes. <laughs> I stopped thinking about my ex-boyfriend altogether as long as I was checking Dan's online presence every morning, afternoon, evening, lunch break, bathroom break, and traffic stop in my day. Dan was going to be my new boyfriend now, duh. <laughs> Over time, I would weave an imaginary narrative about his day, his previous relationships, current hopes, fears, dreams, and desires, and then I'd cater them to my own and imagine our lives intertwining. I became obsessive to the point where if I was at the grocery store in the aisle with sliced cheeses, I would ask myself, which cheese would my future boyfriend Dan like? American, probably? No, he seems like more of a provolone dude. Then I'd select a bag of provolone, a cheese that I'd never eaten in my whole life, <laughs> place it in my basket, and walk away like it was the most normal thought of all time. <laughs> Sometimes I'd pull away from my crazy tendencies and ask myself if this behavior was normal. Why was I doing this to myself? Could I blame it on my lack of interaction with any other guys? I wasn't going out to bars or contributing in any sort of a social scene. Could I blame it on social media and the convenience of having a single person displayed on an easy to navigate web format where I could effortlessly compare his taste to mine and imagine us together so easily 24 hours a day? Could I blame it on the cause of my recent breakup and how I convinced myself that the only man who could ever understand me would have to be a comedian or an artistic type, which was totally Dan Voss, since by process of elimination, he was the only quasi-attractive comedian within 70 miles of me? Or could I just blame it on the fact that Dan Voss was fucking perfect and adorable and specifically manufactured by the heavens as my soulmate? However crazy I was about Dan, it certainly didn't prepare me for what happened next. Little did I know, Dan already had considered a place for me in his life, the friend zone. <laughs> I realized I was in the friend zone over the course of three interactions with Dan. The first was when I emailed him asking if he wanted to grab drinks the next time he was in town, and he never responded to that email. <laughs> Second was after a show I saw him at in a local bar. I got only a few sentences of conversation in with him, but it seemed to be going well. So when I noticed him saying goodbye to his friends, I came up with an exit strategy. Oh, are you leaving? I'll walk out with you, I said with my keys in hand. I had seen it in movies a hundred times. The walk to the car was always where sparks flew first. 
We left the building and I started to confidently chat it up with small talk. However, my pre-rehearsed yet breezy banter was cut short when I realized his car was parked way closer than I had planned. <laughs> like ridiculously close, like six feet from the bar. <laughs> oh, you're parked right here? Awesome. Well, uh, it was good seeing you. And before I knew it, he was in his car driving away. And then I cussed myself out on the way to my car that I strategically parked four blocks away. Why four blocks? Because I imagined it would make for a long romantic walk where he could get to know me and my current hopes, fears, dreams, and desires if he only wasn't parked in a spot six feet away from the bar. <laughs> it all came to an end, sadly, on a rainy November night in LA. I was visiting Hollywood, I, in, I was visiting some friends in Hollywood and had planned to stop by the show he ran in a theater downtown. Totally casual, I told myself, like I was already in the neighborhood. Yet, in reality, I was a good 40 minutes away. <laughs> As I walked into the theater, I tried to push fantasies out of my mind. Fantasies involving us laughing the night away in some late night nearby diner where he'd savagely fall in love with me over a plate of pancakes. I spotted him leaning against the wall in the hallway at the edge of the audience, and I approached him quietly while the show was going on. Hi, I whispered. He looked confused, then realized who I was, and said, oh, hi, back, and an awkward half-hug commenced. <laughs> I said it was good to see him. He nodded and then stepped back watching the show. Not exactly hitting it off so far. I tried to initiate a conversation, but his attention was taken away by others in the hallway. I tried again to initiate a convo, once again derailed by others. And then I noticed him looking and waving and making gestures to another girl across the theater. I was starting to feel like seeing me wasn't a priority for him. <laughs> and my plan, which I so confidently believed in for so long, started to feel embarrassing. I stood there quietly alone in the hallway, occasionally watching the show, occasionally checking my phone for no reason, but feeling super awkward and trying to not look completely desperate the whole time. Then Dan approached me. Hey, this is gonna sound weird, but would you mind doing me a favor? Now, in my state of desperation, <laughs> any interaction with him was considered progress, but doing him a favor wasn't quite the execution I had planned for us being together forever. I was looking more for a flirty, you know, compliment of my outfit or a grasp of my arm, not a, hey, sorry to bug you, but please help me with some sort of task, you human who seems capable of doing tasks. <laughs> and ultimately, upon hearing that he needed a favor, it was hard for me to keep from screaming, if the favor is to be your girlfriend forever, but of course, don't be silly. <laughs> He started to explain himself. So normally we have someone working our merch table, but she's not here. I have to leave and close out the show, but do you mind watching the merch table so nobody takes our stuff? Now, in my years of going to concerts and festivals, I've studied the social and interpersonal dynamics of tending to a merch table. <laughs> And I've noticed how the people working merch tables are usually younger girls, sometimes quiet or awkward. Basically, it's a job given to the creature lowest on the entertainment food chain, fangirls. <laughs> girls who want to be close to the band, but the band doesn't necessarily want to be close to them, so they stick them by their merch and have them do their dirty work. So when Dan Vost asked me to watch his merch table, he not only locked me in the friend zone, but he christened me with the extra special title of fangirl. I stared at him confused with my mouth open, but no words coming out. I know it's a weird request, he said, but I'll give you a free shirt. <laughs> what the fuck was happening? <laughs> This was not the fairy tale moment I was planning for. This was some cold, hard friend zone shit. This was some, I'm not interested in you in that way, so could you do me a favor and watch my stuff shit? And for a free shirt? Oh, let me guess what it says. I pined over Dan Voss for months until he put me in the friend zone and all I got was this lousy t-shirt? But I didn't know how to say no. 
So he led me over to the merch table and said he'd be back shortly. I watched Dan walk away and I was left waiting in a huge lobby filled with only three people. I felt frantic standing there. I began shifting my weight, moving my arms, checking my phone, putting away my phone, checking my phone again, anything to try and find a stance that didn't look like I just had my crazy little heart ripped out and assigned to merch table duty. (laughs) Minutes later, people began exiting the theater and pouring into the lobby. With no specific instructions left for me, I basically stood there quietly, giving the stink eye to anyone who came near me. (laughs) I searched the crowd for Dan and saw him talking to the girl that he was previously talking to across the theater. And with that, I knew it was over. The writing was on the wall. It was hopeless. I felt pathetic and alone. And for the first time in months, I thought about Mike. (laughs) And I remembered how it ended on the phone. I wondered where he was and if he was somewhere making a fool out of himself the same way I was, all in an attempt to try and avoid dealing with the pain of our breakup. I had never let myself let go of Mike. I had bypassed that typical breakup pain you're supposed to feel. I instead found Dan on Facebook, manifested him into my new imaginary boyfriend, and used that as the tourniquet to the bloody wound that was my breakup. I didn't want to face the colorless timeline of comprehension it takes to actually get over someone you've loved and the grayness of it all. Moments later, Dan made his way over behind the table and started shuffling through boxes. With my face turned away, stuck in a depressed thought of Mike, I heard Dan call my last name. Condi, my last name, which for the record, if you're calling me by my last name, I get it, that means you don't want to have sex with me. And then he underhand tossed me a shirt. My penance for approximately 12 minutes of watching the merch table. And this was no ordinary toss. As the shirt met my face, (laughs) it felt as though he was a little league coach telling me to get off the field. I had given it my best, but this game was not to be won, so better throw in the towel, Condi. I survived the two hour drive back to San Diego in the rain with the postal services the district sleeps alone, playing on repeat the whole time. It was your typical cliche, sad, mopey anthem, but I needed a song like that. It was long overdue. Dan Voss rejecting me seemed heartbreaking, but really, I had some previous heartache to attend to. I had to let myself cope with my breakup from Mike. So, obviously, It was time to stalk his Facebook (laughs) and obsess on a picture of him with his new girlfriend. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Laura Condi. 